So let's talk a little bit about the transport level. The transport level is how we ship packets across the network. There's two basic types of transport we worry about. That's TCP and UDP. TCP is guaranteed packet. If you lose one, it's going to retransmit. Phone systems don't use that. Phone systems use UDP for almost everything, <coughs> except for like our web interface, something like that. All of our control, SIP control, IX control, um, and our media streams, be it video or audio, are all around in UDP. So if the packet doesn't get through, it just gets lost. So, um, of course, it's reliable. The UDP is unreliable, unordered, but it's very, very lightweight on the system. So when you start getting, you know, lots of phone calls going on inside of a LAN, you know, it's very lightweight of a data stream. So the common ports we use mm -hmm. in a telephony system is 22 is just for maintenance, but I can guarantee you, you calls for support, one of the first things that we usually say is, do you have port 22 open? That's kind of like the first thing that comes out of our mouth when we need help. TCP is just for doing the web interfaces. We don't ever ask that for remotely because we just tell it through 22. Because this is a TCP protocol, and so we can tell it through 22. The um, uh, IAX2 is a, is a communication protocol between two switches. It stands for, I believe, um, inter, uh, excuse me? inter asterisk communication, and this is the second version of it. And it's been around for quite a while. It's what almost everybody in the ASTRIC community uses to tie two boxes together. For non-ASTRIC implementations, they use SIP. But SIP is not, SIP is more designed for talking from a peer to a client. Where IAX works good for peer to client, but it's designed really good for many channels talking between two boxes, and it's much, much more efficient than SIP. Then 4445 is our flash operator panel control port. So, and you can see anything you want with, um, if you open up 4445, but you can't necessarily um, whisper or spy uh, because it's going to try to run R RTP packets through your firewall. Your R RTP packets are going to be from 10,000 to 20,000, and your SIP control is going to be 5060 or 5064. These are the ports you need to worry about when you have when you want to be able to manage your system remotely or if you want to have remote phones. For remote phones, you actually only need these bottom two. And they say, well, gee, that leaves my system wide open, you know, to hackers. There's a little bit of truth in there's a lot of truth to that. There's also a lot of truth about protecting yourself. First thing someone says, just set your firewall rule up to be end-to-end -end IP. So you set a firewall up so that your endpoint has a static IP, has a static IP of your endpoint, and your server has a static IP. You just program it that way, no one can hack it. Absolutely right. If someone's got a remote phone, the odds are it's sitting at their house, running through a DSL modem, through a provider that's giving you a DHCP address. And though you can run it off of um, those DHCP look up things and the software is smart enough to, you can actually add that into the server, I find it's not very reliable. And so, so pegging both as an IP to secure your, your link is, is, is not going to work in most cases. What is going to work in most cases is use, use good passwords. When you go to implement your system, use a good password for all the phones. If implementing all the instructions and extensions, you don't want to type a 10 or 12 character um, upper lowercase numeric type password. You get all the different extensions and export them, put the new password in in the spreadsheet, import it back in again, or the cut and import it back in again, and now you've got a really good secure password on all your phones. But the right way to go is just, just use a secure password for your, for your secret on your extension and then put fail to ban on your system. If you have a decent six, seven, eight character password with a couple unusual characters or uppercase, lowercase in it, no one's going to get past the, at least the script that we write, it, it lets a person mess up five times on fail to ban. 
and then puts them in jail. Usually they get in jail by the seventh time. Reason being is that we fail to ban scans, your different logs inside your system, not just the, the uh, telephone logs, but the log in SSH, um, your mail, uh, mail, you know, FTP, all those passwords, it scans all those log files. And it's scanning log files all the time as a very low priority. So it's the last guy in the world to get service. So you got lots of phone calls, sometimes it's going to take me a second or two to get a chance to find, to, to check its, the most recent logs, the tail of the log, to find out, you know, what, what has come through and if someone's getting rejected log files. So if you got it set for five, it could t- I've seen it take as long as ten failed attempts before it actually puts the person in jail. But ten attempts with a, with a complex password is no big deal. And so, you know, it, so, you know, leaving these open and running fail to ban to monitor your SIP traffic, and what fail to ban does, during our install script, it asks you for the email address you want to send it to. When someone's trying to hack you and put somebody in jail, it sends you an email and says, hey, I expect this guy in jail. And so you see somebody bang on your system. So it's actually pretty secure. But the only one you have to open up, of course, is 5060 to 5064 and 10,000 to 20,000. So you can make this smaller if you want to. I don't do it often, but if you want to go in and edit um, uh, rtp.conf in the asterisk directory in the evil CLI land, uh, you can shoot that down to like about, if you've got only, um, you know, about four to five ports per endpoint is what RTP needs. Never make it less than 200. You know, make it at least, you know, five, 600. You can shut it down. We keep it from, from 10,000 to 10,000. And actually, we make it 10,001 to 20,000. Anybody got an idea why we make it 10,001 to 20,000 and we don't use 10,000? We use Webman. In the latest release of Webmin, um, port 10,000, both TCP and UDP are used by Webmin for management. And we find Webmin to be a very, very good tool with, very, with excellent documentation, public avail- publicly available documentation to be managing the Linux part of your system. Like, I am not capable of going into the command line and editing the, um, the Linux uh, files or mapping the, um, the firewall. I can pull up enough books to do it, but it's just way more work than I ever want to do in one particular day. I jump into Webman, I just pull a couple boxes, create a few rules, bang, and Linux firewall's up and running. 